Now I'd like to give floor to Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who is the chief curator of our core exhibition. Actually, she is the mastermind behind the core exhibition of our museum. And uh, I have asked uh, uh, Barbara to uh, kindly introduce the major themes of this uh, conference and also our keynote speaker today. Barbara, please. Your Excellency and honored guests, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome you to Pauline Museum. And I, I hope I'm correct in assuming that you have indeed visited the core exhibition this morning because Pauline Museum is really a perfect setting for this conference, which is European-wide, it's international, and it's exploring Jewish cultural heritage. And I think the comments that we just heard, that the history of Jews in Europe and the history of Polish Jews is more than the Holocaust, and it's also more than a history of persecution. It's also a history of Jewish life, Jewish achievement, Jewish civilization, and it's also a story of how a minority community can be continuously present for a millennium in the case of Poland and can, on the one hand, be very much themselves and at the same time be part of the wider society. And so uh, the, the conference that, I, that, that, that awaits us is a banquet. It's a very rich set of sessions representing a diverse set of issues. And I think the words of the conference, to call it Jewish cultural heritage, is a very, very good starting point. And that is that it raises the question around very specific projects, some of which are memorials, some of which are organized around the Holocaust, other of which have to do with the preservation of Jewish material heritage. But I think that of special importance, and it has been critical in the development of the core exhibition here at Pauline Museum, is what I would call intangible culture and intangible heritage. And this is a topic that we'll be taking up today in our session at 315, Exhibition Narratives, Memorials and Museums, because we are here on a site where this museum, this thousand year story of Polish Jews, stands in relationship to the monument to the ghetto heroes and completes the memorial complex. And that relationship, I think, will turn out to be quite important in the, uh, in the days that follow. I would like to now take the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker. I am a great fan of uh, Diana Pinto. I have followed her work for many, many years, and we're most fortunate that she was able to make the time to come here to speak to us today. Diana comes from an Italian Jewish family. She's based in Paris, and she's an intellectual historian who studied at Harvard University, where she received her PhD in contemporary Jewish history. Her work on Jewish life in Europe and in relation to Israel is really groundbreaking. And uh, her interest mo and her most recent work deals with Israel in 2013. She's a consultant and has been a consultant to the Council of Europe on civil society in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And I would suggest to you that um, her policy report that was uh, published in 1996 and that is, it's a new Jewish identity for post-1989 Europe, I would consider this required reading. She puts forward a very bold thesis, a thesis uh, that Europe since 1989 could become the third pillar, and I'm quoting, of a world Jewish identity at the crossroads of newly integrated past and a pluralist democratic, democratic future. Now that was 20 years ago, and as I understand today, she will reflect on where we are now in relation to the picture that she painted and what she saw 20 years ago. It's my great pleasure to welcome Diana Pinto. I'm deeply honored, good afternoon, to have been, to be here among you, to have been invited to give the introductory keynote speech, and uh, to be once again inside this spectacular museum and educational center. <laughs> 
I have contemplated life, Jewish life in Europe for the last 20, 25 years in what I perceive to be a very positive, ongoing development of a borderless, pluralist, open, tolerant continent. And I have been working on these issues for a long time because my interest was in pluralist democracy. So I speak to you here not as an expert of Jewish heritage or Jewish cultural access, but as a historian and political analyst. And then you're free for the next three days to indulge in much prettier, more interesting, positive understandings of where Europe is today. But first of all, let me say one thing. To be standing here in the auditorium of the Polish Museum, for someone who's old enough to have been an adult already when the Berlin Wall fell down, I have to say that someone living in Paris, what an amazing conclusion to what was not an obvious outcome. I remember 20 years ago, and, and then in the following decade, bold and courageous representatives of the Jewish Historical Society from Warsaw, acting as emissaries, trying to convince Europeans and European Jews from Western Europe that there had to be such a museum. And I remember very clearly to what an extent there was massive Jewish opposition to the very idea that one could build a museum of Jewish culture on the ground of the Warsaw Ghetto. In other words, that one would then start to talk about a wonderful past, a dangerous past, a conflictual past that ended in horror, and that who would want to want to remember even what had happened? The implicit assumptions were, A, that Poland was an anti-Semitic society, B, that the Poles had been destroyed, the Polish Jews had been destroyed, and that the survivors had moved on. Consequently, who on earth would want to hear of such a museum? Think about the importance of how important now Poland has become, not just in Poland, across Europe and in the world. What a pessimistic understanding of the past, and a clearly, I mean, obviously, a justifiable one. But how much we've moved on and how more spirits and humanity has opened its ideas and opened itself to the world. How can one not imagine that there should be in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial something to indicate that there had been a long, thriving life, and nowadays a smaller but equally thriving, smaller Jewish community in Poland? So it is a victory over odds that we're celebrating here in this very auditorium. And I'm very happy to be able to participate in it. Well, I chose to subtitle my talk, my talk, What Kind of a Success Story for the Years 1989 to 2015? The success story is absolutely undebatable. Never has the Jewish reference, Jewish life, Jewish history, Jewish literature, Jewish movies, call it what you will, is what Ruth Ellen Gruber called it, things Jewish, thrived as much on the European continent as it did in those 10, 15 years. An unprecedented visibility, unprecedented centrality in some cases, especially in the mid-1990s. Cultivating the Jewish reference was deemed to be crucial for each of Europe's modern nations, especially in the expanding optimistic vision that followed 1989, and especially not without conflict, and I shall speak about this very soon, um, in the newly liberated lands of Eastern Europe. One could say that it could be, you could say, that the Jewish reference was both ethical and realpolitical. It was good politically for nations to recall it because it meant that by recalling the old pluralist past, they were making a kind of pledge of allegiance to a future pluralism. It was ethical because there had been the losses, it had been the Holocaust. It was also real political. I remember that in the 1990s, many said that countries in Eastern Europe would like to remember the Jewish past because they want, wanted most favored trade agreement with the United States, because they wanted entrance into NATO. There was always this notion that the Jews would be brought out only for reasons that were not very ethical. It was not true and I fought back then against such a position and I think that the proof in our educational centers across Europe stands out that the interest in Jewish things was certainly not only real political. It was good for tourism, it was all above all important ethically. Now, here comes the difficult part. <laughs> 
I can sit here and talk about the success story, but I don't think that was why I was invited. I suppose I was invited because one has to assess the consequences of this 25 years or 20 years of development of the Jewish cultural heritage across Western and Eastern Europe. What kind of a success story was it? Were there any perverse effects to it? Can one speak of the dangers of having one, one's wishes come true? What were the wishes? And in how did this cultural heritage influence Jewish and non-Jewish relations across the continent? Is the success viable and above all durable? And what is its living component? And with what future in a time in which Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and Western Europe especially, are falling prey to new currents of anti-Semitism, and Jews are even leaving parts of the continent. There is an international point of view of this. The American Jewish component, the Israeli component, are not neutral bystanders. They're influencing, important, and play a weight, both in wishing to have the cultural heritage, but also in assessing what they still are not so sure about, an ongoing Jewish presence on the European continent. So first of all, a statement, and I'm sorry to be dry and a bit analytical, uh, but I think a few things should be said. I think it would be very wrong to assume that we've just finished the golden years of Jewish heritage and political love and Jewish, non-Jewish interaction. If you look back into those years and how all the leading museums of Europe were set up, there was constant conflict. There were not one clear Jewish position. There were many and they were in conflict with each other and the whole issue of Jewish heritage. The battles were fraught with tensions from the onset and above between Jews and non-Jews, and above within the Jewish world itself. And they continue to remain fraught. I can only point to one article written by Rothenberg in a peak called What is Wrong with Jewish Museums, in which he chides at the notion, he's a leading uh, comment, I mean, journalists on museums with the New York Times saying, what is wrong with the Jews? Why do they just build themselves a nice Jewish identity museum, stress the fact that the Holocaust happened really only to the Jews, and stop trying to make universal lessons out of all of this? What's wrong? Why do they, can, I, can they not resemble you know, Japanese American museums or Indian museums or whatever museums? Me, 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 and nothing else. And I think it's a very dangerous possibility of an ethnic nationalist understanding of a Jewish presence that is floating about as so many other ethnic nationalist identities are coming across today. As for the non-Jewish world, I've often said that I pity the non-Jews who try to interact with Jews because <laughs> it's not an easy task. And I can say that because I'm not a non-Jew, I am a Jew because the complexity of the interlocutors, the very different Jewish positions on every aspect of Jewish past and present, the impact of Israel and America and the balance, as well as the claims of an increasingly strong orthodoxy, have taken their toll it's often on the live and let live philosophy of a pluralist, open, harmonious context. One doesn't quite know how to speak to the Jews because there are no Jews as such to speak to. And there is a temptation of moving on, having the different parts of the Jewish world have what they want, and then moving on to what are the more important problems of today, populism, terrorism, refugees, whatnot. And perhaps saying, we've done it, I'm speaking here as a potential non-Jew, we've done it, now let it flow on its own because there are other issues at hand. So let me just, speak to you in terms of five key questions that should be addressed, perhaps, that I will address anyway. What is Jewish history, excuse me, Jewish heritage, and for whom is it preserved? In the name of what and whom? Were the years 1989-2015 unique? Can their momentum be sustained? Or are we in a reverse mode? Or is there a diff and is there a difference between East and West? Or is there just a time lag? What is the link between Jewish heritage and Jewish life in an age in which there are no more virtual Jews? Has Jewish heritage been put on the map of Europe? Yes, it has. But how stable is this map? 
And finally, what, if any, are the perverse effects that have come out of the fireworks of the last 25 years of Jewish centrality and visibility? So what is Jewish heritage and for whom was it perverse? Who, in whose name are we preserving it? I think there are several ways of understanding why there should be a Jewish heritage. The first one could be called settling accounts. And the statement of such a museum or situation would be as follows. Jews were here, Jews are here, and Jews will remain here. Consequently, we're entitled as Jews to that visibility. A second position would be to say, Jews are part of your wider national culture. Maybe you don't know it or you have not acknowledged it as central, but there's a shared universality, a common belonging, and your own national culture would not be quite the what it is were it not for the long Jewish presence in its midst. Third position, Jews are different and proudly so. No desire to disappear, uniqueness counts, parallel histories behind what seem to be superficial commonalities. Jewishness and universal values are always in a very complex interrelation, and they go up and down, not unlike the stock market, and it depends what is going on in the outside world. But in reality, we cannot present the Jewish past as just one more chapter in a wider national consensus. Then there's the position of saying, we must educate the Jewish wider world into a specific national Jewish history. And there is no place as vital on this front as the Poland Museum, since so many of the Jews around the world in Israel and the United States hearken back to Jewish Polish roots. Consequently, you educate basically the Jews to a lost past, a lost glory, a lost injustice, a lost horror, and perhaps in a small room, something about the present and maybe the future. Then there is the notion of saying we must reinforce the sense of Jewish identity and belonging of the local Jewish populations, not only the wider public, but even the Jews themselves. This goes up and down in function of how many Jews are inside a national setting. The fewer the Jews, the more important such a commitment is. Otherwise, in countries that have many Jewish populations, many, many Jews, there are other institutions that really educate Jews to their own past. Then there might be the other position of saying, give a universal measure, message to Europe's others. We were like you, or we were not like you, for the new arrivals and the immigrants. But do remember that we as Jews love the land and the language, that we stress Dino Malkeno and we followed its laws, and that we longed to integrate. It may have happened with a horrendous consequence, but Jews have always wanted to belong as citizens, and therefore, you new arrivals should learn from us, or at least take us into account. Finally, two more things. One, create a new sense of civic duty. As a non-Jew, I feel committed to pursue the development and the history and the cultural heritage of the Jews. And I was just reading now about the very powerful efforts of non-Jews to clean up the Warsaw Cemetery, the Jewish Cemetery of Warsaw, and do other things, not just in the main cities, but also in the local levels. These are very important notions of moral duty to a past that can no longer be taken up by the current living Jews because there are not enough of them. This is very important, and it's truly more of a Eastern European phenomenon than a Western European phenomenon for all sorts of reasons. Cleaning up of Jewish cemeteries makes no sense in France because the cemeteries are owned by the French state, and there's no grass in them, or very little. And consequently, the Jews are not owners of their own plots of land which means that if someone is a Jew wishes to eat a ham sandwich on his father's tomb on Kippur, he or she may be free to do so because the cemetery is, of course, open. A final element, the religious dialogue. This had been an element of saying the Jewish identity and the non-Jewish. It's a very interesting element because it is a spin-off of the Jewish-Christian dialogues that dominated post-war Europe after the Holocaust and led up to the Nostra Aetate encyclical of 1965. But oddly enough, and I remember speaking with Silly Kugelman about this in Berlin, at the Jewish Museum of Berlin, uh, a few years back, and she said, you know, Diana, this whole notion of putting parallel calendars to show people that Jewish and Christian holidays have quite a bit in common, and that therefore, you know, Passover, Pesach, and Easter, 
Shavuot and Pentecost, there's a similarity. It doesn't work. People don't even know their Christian calendar. Consequently, they make the connections is very, very strange. And on top of it, what about the Turks? So that's another element, interreligious dialogue. And this can be done, and it should be done, but it's not always as easy as one can think. Remember Freud's famous notion of the narcissism of small differences. The more you have in common with someone else, the more the tensions can arise. I'm sorry to be sounding a little pessimistic here. Second element that I had mentioned, the uniqueness of the 1989-2015 period. Well, there was a thrill, passion, the rediscovered identity, a new European hope, everything I wrote about that Barbara mentioned in my article in 1996. A sense of return of Jewish life, that the Holocaust has finally came out of the silence. An element of a... Uh, Jewish international organizations pitching in, national governments looking at the past and wanting to do something, European institutions feeling that the Jewish contribution was crucial, international heritage associations, everything was converging on the notion of the Jewish presence in Europe and the Jewish past. It was a flourishing, and it tried to accomplish all sorts of elements. Everyone wanted to do the seven previous elements I noted about what you wanted to do Jewish heritage for. There were certainly complexities. I mean, the Jewish Museum in Berlin did not grow beautifully out into its building without tension. There were massive tensions between the State Museum of, of Berlin and the Jewish wing that Libeskin was supposed to perform, to create. And finally, there was a Jewish victory in that the Jewish story took over the entire building and the State Museum of Berlin went off somewhere else. I'll return to some of these victories, which in my mind become Pyrrhic in the long term. Anyway, uh, the French Museum, it was chock full of strife between the Jewish community, strife because the Sephardic Jews did not think they were given enough space compared to the Ashkenazi Jews, strife with the French state, strife over which day it was closed. So let us not think that this was all wonderful and fantastic. There was strife all along. And Jewish and Jewish heritage made the headlines linked to the past, not to a dangerous present. And perhaps what has happened is that the story of the past is not returning. I cannot bear to imagine people making the least comparison with the 1930s. It would be an insult to those who lived through them and were killed in those years. But uh, can all of this investment, optimism, push, I mean, a push to create and make amends, think of a new world, can this be sustained? Are we feeling now that a zeitgeist is changing, that there are other major issues? Are funds drying up? And I do thank the Norwegian monarchy and the country and its institutions for not drying up the funds on behalf of these projects. It is a very unique, a very important element, plus the European Union, of course. There are new challenges elsewhere. There is a kind of Jewish fatigue in the air. And then there's the bureaucratization of a new normality. What was brand new, like a new frontier 25 years ago, will slowly take in the routine, normal bureaucratization, plus the professionalization. There were no Jewish studies to speak of in Europe 25 or 30 years ago. Now it's an incredible field. But, and I see all these young faces here in the auditorium. Wonderful, you have the positions, but what about a new generation? What kind of positions can it have? So there might be one of these effects of creating a field, creating a moment, and then it continues, but it cannot expand because you just cannot expand beyond a certain element. And of course, there are other minorities across Europe that want their own status and belonging recognized, turned into a cultural heritage of their own, plus their own wounds that have to be repaired. And this clash is one that we're living on a daily basis, and I will not go into it because I think other people will address this issue in the coming uh, days. Um, what is, I mean, so this, this internal constraints cannot be forgotten. And there's a consolidated field, but maybe behind it all, we're going back into reverse mode, not necessarily in terms of forgetting the Shoah, or relativizing it, or denying it, but simply, okay, it happened, that was a long time ago. We must now turn on to something else, or figure out the lessons of the Holocaust for others, or today's new people. And this is a very difficult issue to tackle, 
and I know how difficult it is because there are emotions there that can barely be contained. And on this front, are we live, living through a time chart or a qualitative chart? I mean, the Poland Museum is the last of the major museums to have been created across continental Europe. I'm leaving Russia specifically aside. Um, the joy of this museum, does it match the joy of the French Museum when it opened in Paris? Does it match the joy, although it was a very strange joy because the, the Berlin Museum was inaugurated literally as the towers in Manhattan were bombed, so that it was a 2001 inauguration exactly on uh, September 9th, 10th, and 11th. And uh, was there something there that, you know, in a sense, are we, and with the Polish thing, reaching the core of cores in terms of Jewish history across Europe? Is this an end point, or is the Poland Museum able to rethink forward, but it is a very complex issue because as we talk about multicultural identities, we are of course very much aware of the fact that Poland is no longer multicultural, nor is Poland exceedingly worried or interested in the millions of refugees that are walking into Western and Central Europe today. So we have political constraints that must not be forgotten, and Poland is not a case in point to be isolated. Of course, all of Europe is going through a phase of rethinking with backlash. And what does this Jewish icon, what does this Jewish reference mean for the future? Unclear, both for the Jews who feel that they should take back a hold on it, and for the non-Jews who do not know quite, quite what to make with it. To, you can reintegrate it into the national patrimony, and then what, close the door to the other others? Very delicate, very, very delicate. So what is the link between Jewish heritage and Jewish life? I mentioned before that there could be an inverse proportion. The more Jews you have, the less the importance of the national understanding of Jewish heritage. The fewer you have, the more Jewish heritage takes on a preponderant position. Is each group going its own way? In other words, those who perform Jewish heritage and the active living Jews, are they on the same wavelength? It's an important question to find out. I have always found that Jewish prof professionals of the Jewish heritage, especially when they're not Jewish, but even when they are, are not as quickly able or want to, and perhaps it's a good thing, to reflect the anguish of the living Jews in their midst. It's like two parallel roads. Maybe that is the way they should be, certainly if it's a scientific profession. But there comes a gap between fears and you know, perceived reality and the calmness of a cultural heritage or museum field. It's a question I'm throwing at you. I'm only trying to provoke here. I'm not giving you final responses. Uh, the French Jewish Museum has turned itself into a lively and very important place of intellectual discussions with Jews in its midst, touching on wider aspects of French society. The German Museum has done a lot in terms of bringing in Muslim themes along with Jewish themes and issues of identity inside a complex German, originally mainly German society. The, but are they preaching to the converted? I often wonder when I go to, to my to the Paris talks, inside those auditoriums, you already have the kernel of everything you would hope Europe or the world would be, open, tolerant, curious, anti-racist, anti, of course, fighting any kind of xenophobia. They're all in there. But what is the impact just outside. Of course, classes and schools come to these museums. Perhaps my optimism has been tainted by living in Paris. How many classes, how many groups can come into the museums, and what is the repercussion outside when there are clashes and tensions that bring the Jews in as living parts of a political clash and dialogue. This, of course, implies large Jewish communities. Jews as such would not be a living part, I don't think, in many of the countries, and I will not speak about Poland today. Um, but certainly, the heritage, the never again, the Holocaust, the beautiful multimillennial presence of Jews across France, or Italy, or Germany. Yes, it plays a role, but does it play a role where it counts in con converting, or in any way, influencing those political actors who see things differently, who feel that the Jews have gotten too big a chunk of the pie in terms of visibility, sorrow, mourning, and so forth. We are entering very rocky waters. The Jews are no longer the ultimate other. 
across Europe. There's many factors, there's domesticated and other as can be. And much of the antipathy and anguish, of course, is not turned toward the Jews in Western Europe, but naturally toward Israel. So does heritage replace life? Does life need that much heritage? The Sephardic Jews of France do not feel as though they're represented in the Jewish Museum in Paris, for instance. So there's an issue. When we talk about heritage, are we going to give road professionally to what I would call Egyptology, the reading of texts, understanding a very distant culture, or even more dangerously, are we going to be playing and putting up on the wall butterflies, very beautiful but dead? What happens with the living butterflies? And here there is a real, and I want to raise this because many years ago, <clears throat> In a project linked to Paideia, the Institute for Jewish Textual Study in Stockholm, uh, the, the organizer, I mean, the, the, the creator of the project, Paideia, um, Barbara um, uh, Spector, um, had the idea of bringing in for an education about Passover young museum specialists who were not Jewish. And it turned out that in many important Jewish museums, and I thought this was one of the great strengths of Europe, that Jews and non-Jews would handle together the Jewish heritage, practically no one had ever assisted a real Jewish Seder. In other words, they knew about it. They were perfect in setting up the Seder table in the museum, and that was no problem. They did it better than most Jews. They knew exactly what went on to the Seder plate, exactly where it should be. But they never actually witnessed the Seder, Consequently, there is a problem here between the heritage and the life. And so, uh, in both cases, and then the other element is that throughout this Holocaust commemoration, startly enough, it opened up what I would call new wounds among Jews who did not even go through the Holocaust, whose, par whose des descendants, of, whose parents or grandparents had not even gone through the Holocaust. So you have there a very complex issue. You have a Jewish heritage that is brought out for a wider public, for the Jews as well, and then something happens. The interaction between the Jews and the non-Jews is not as obvious as it could be. Then, the final two questions, is the map on which we're putting Jews, putting Jews on the European map, as stable upon as we could think. Clearly not, I've already alluded to this. But there is what I would call three elements. The European project is under question. The routinization of Jewish narratives and professionalization of the field creates an element of, well, not déjà vu, but certainly the ongoing life. Then there is the element of the narratives of comparative suffering, which are turning into an ugly zero-sum game again across Europe. My suffering hasn't gotten as much exposure as your suffering, and why do the Jews get all of this suffering mentioned, whereas we don't? And it's a very ugly, horrendous practice, but unfortunately, politics is not always pleasant. Anti-Semitism is raising its ugly head, the Israel factor has fallen back in. Let's not, let's not forget that when the glorious years of the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s took place, peace seemed to be around the corner in Israel. It is not around the corner in Israel today. And there's a lot of going on which takes on very nasty overlappings of unsaid and said elements. And what I find very interesting is that the, Western, the European narrative was that the Eastern lands were disgusting, anti-Semitic and horrible. But a new type of anti-Semitism is taking place not in the East, but in the West. And of all places in the UK, where with the labor scandals, you have a sensation that certain unsaid things can now be said, especially in a country that is Holocaust free. Consequently, these are all elements that have brought in a lot of scuro in the chiaro scuro of a long historical narrative. Then the return of national narratives. Well, this is a very complex issue. Where do the Jews fit in the national narratives? They are part, of, part and parcel of them. They died for their respective nations. They volunteered to defend. They were in the resistance. But the overall zeitgeist of the Jewish world did not give much credit to this kind of, I'm dying as a Polish patriot or as an Italian patriot. There was a feeling of, how alienated could you really be? You should have remained Jewish, Jewish. Look what happened to you with all of your iron crosses and medals from each nation. Consequently, this element now is coming back, and there is a tendency to return, and I think it's a positive one, 
to that background in which the Jews were really living part and parcel elements of the national narratives. We are in a field in which Europe is turning itself into a national narrative. The European belonging is very abstract, and Jews across Europe and the non-Jews who live and work with the Jews and Jewish heritage are taking that into account. It is in the zeitgeist. You were there when it counted kind of thing. Although, of course, in the Polish context, of course, in the, walking in the streets of Warsaw, you see a lot of plaques for 1944 and not that many for 1943, of course. But uh, this coming back to this element is both positive and complicated, because if you understand quite clearly, returning the Jews inside the national national narrative creates a great dissociation with Israel on one hand and American Jewry or American Jewish elements on the other. Because deep inside in these two pillars of the Jewish world, there's a feeling of how can these Jews still be living on this horrendous continent? And are we going to underscore how much they really wanted to be part of their nation states? So there is always a shifting balance and a not an easy one to take care of. Finally, what were the perverse effects I had in mind? Well, the victory about Jewish specificity had a counterweight. And I mentioned the Jewish Museum of Berlin as a case in point. Because what happened? National museums across Europe nowadays are perfectly free not to have to take into account the Jewish past. They'll put a nice sign up in a corner and say, if you want to know about the Jewish past, go down the road and there's an entirely beautiful new Jewish museum where you can learn all about it. But something gets broken in the process. You want to say the Jews belonged, but the national museums will no longer tell you that the Jews belonged. It will be a chapter or a series of rooms inside the Jewish museum in function of the country. And I always mention that because when the Gemal de Galerie was opened in Berlin with the wonderful marble white floors and the water and so forth, my final reaction was, and I know the statistics, the numbers are not with me. I mean, I don't agree with what I'm going to say, but I'm saying this in a longer term. Well, you go into the Jewish Museum, you start crooked into the you know, strange corridors that Libeskin has produced, you go up and down, and then you've done it. And then you go out, and then you go see the Kultur Forum, the Gemal de Galerie, and you go back into real culture. We've paid penance for the Jews, but now you know, they can have their own thing. And I want to say this because it's an easy way out for national, com for national constructs. There was one particular exhibit, I want to just dwell on it for a second, which was that of the Lewe family. It was held in the Jewish Museum of Berlin. This was the family who were cast, who made the metal castings of all things for the Dem Deutschen Volk on the Reichstadt. They created the horses on the St. Petersburg Embassy. This was, you know, a sign of a completely assimilated, integrated, very important family. What happens to this exhibit? It goes to the Jewish Museum, but it's very technical. It's all in German, which means that the Los Angeles Jew, the Jew from France or wherever, doesn't see it because he or she can't read all this German stuff. But it doesn't go into the Deutsche Historisches Museum where it should be. And even less does it go into a small basement room of the Reichstadt itself saying, you know, what was the family's fate that they actually cast those precious three words in 1914? inside the, uh, the, the, the Reichstag of today. So you have a transparent ceiling on top of Norman Foster, but not even a basement room about the reality, which is a German reality. And this, I think, is something that as you develop Jewish cultural heritage, it's an important issue. Are the Jews in or not? By having all these wonderful museums on the side, and I'm not saying they're not wonderful, I think they're spectacular, there is a danger that then the national museums can say, oh, they're taking care of it, we don't have to work on it. Then there is the issue of the professionalized Jewish world. The non-Jews who are living in museums, working on this in academic faculties and Jewish studies programs and so forth are basically, well, are they like a security barrier between anti-Semites out there or people who do not understand and the Jews within? Are they involved in one way or another inside this wider Jewish constellation? Perhaps it's their right not to be. I'm not saying that they should be. I'm simply asking because already in 2001, 2002, when the first bursts of, you know, both what's going on in Israel and then, you know, anti Semitism and Muslim uh, intolerance for the Jews, there was a feeling of, well, is this a day, I mean, in other words, is this a nine to five day job? 
or if you're going to work with Jewish things, is it a civic commitment? Is there something that gives greater empathy? I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I feel this is probably the place in which to make such questions, to ask such questions, because maybe it's just, you know, I, I, I study Mars, I study Jews, I study this or that. Can this happen? This would be the ideal of all ideal worlds, but are we living in such a world? I don't know. And so that's another element. And then, what do you do with the Holocaust? Small question, which of course I can handle in six minutes. Uh, what do you do with the Holocaust and the past and what it meant? There's nothing less certain than the past, people say as a joke much less certain than the future. Of course, it's going to be reinterpreted as a world historical phenomenon like the French Revolution and everything else. There will be Holocaust commemorations for the next two centuries. Later, I don't know. But the point is, what will we be saying? And this is where Jewish cultural heritage has to try to figure out how to handle this black hole. Now, I've just been told that Stephen Hawkins has just said that black holes retain the information and also that light can perhaps one day come out of them. The point is, uh, is this central to the understanding Jewish heritage or not? If it's not, what does it mean? Can you just put it aside? Can you just relativize it? Can you turn it into a special place and not handle it as you go into a magnificent history of uh, the long Jewish presence across Europe? So finally, I don't want to end on such a negative position, hardly, but so where are we heading? Well, I think we have to rethink the Jewish narrative. Talk about its specificity, the multiplicity, I would even say the cacophony, clashing voices making a lot of noise within an order that may be itself evol evolving. We do not know what kind of Europe lies ahead. So mapping out the Jewish heritage in it is not an easy thing. I compare this to t putting mercury liquid on an inclined plane that's oily. Try to imagine what happens to the mercury. It you know, multiplies itself into little balls, little dots, and the whole thing is slippery. And the two, well, it's not clear. You can hang on to the mercury, try to reassemble it, prevent the oily surface from slipping out. I don't know, but this is the metaphor that comes to my mind right now. Symbiosis, integration, belonging, hope for the future. Is the Jewish message important for the Muslim presence across Europe? Is it not? It depends. And also, how can one, uh, what is the link between Jews and Christians on this element? Is this triangle a promising one, Jewish, Christian, Muslim relations? Can it be stressed in terms of the long past? What is the significance of the famous conviviencia of uh, Cordoba in golden years of Spain? Can we play on these things or should we really look at what happened behind it all in realizing the tensions, who was in power, who was in the majority, who was in the minority? These are very, very difficult questions. And when you produce the Jewish heritage, it can go in any way. It's, multi, it's really multifaceted and to each his or her interpretation of it. And how you translate that into a museum, I think the Poland Museum has been spectacular on this count. Uh, because it does show the different elements. But it has to be rethought. And there's this internal life, external visibility, intergroup interaction. But none of this is frozen in time. What was done for Jewish heritage during the years 1989, 1995, may or may not be relevant for the decade ahead. And what I do wish to understand is, will these museums of Europe and the consequent completing elements one day become archaeological sites of sorts for a golden period called 1989-2015, the years of glory? Or can they be so adaptable that they become constantly evolving places of questioning as much as presenting? I don't know. I certainly wish you who have the power to act upon these crucial issues, I wish you a very productive conference and I wish you all the best as you tackle one of the most difficult issues of identity, past and present, in a newly configurated European continent. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. We still have some 15 minutes.
So you have a chance to ask questions or make comments to this great uh, keynote speech that we have just heard. Uh, there is a couple of microphones, I understand, so just please raise your hand if you wish to speak. I have frozen you. <laughs> Hello, Diana. It's Jonathan Weber here. I, I'm very, very pleased to hear your statement. Um, and I, I'm sure it's inspiring. We need to study it because you have thrown out several hundred questions um, in this half an hour, and to pick on one or two would be um, in inappropriate. I just um, have to say, with a little bit of self-congratulation, um, that I was at a panel discussion in this very room about a year ago and put forward the idea of present-day Jewish culture and museums as cacophony, um, only to hear you use this very word um, in this very context. I do agree. Um, Barbara speaks about... Sorry, Barbara um, speaks about a chorus of voices, um, and the question is, normally a chorus sings together. She, in her book, says, actually, sometimes they're singing in harmony, sometimes not. It was a very um, carefully constructed argument. Um, I prefer the cacophony, and in fact, would make very much more of it um, to be consistent with your argument today, that there's too much out there that people do not hear the harmonies anymore. And that really what needs to be stressed is the disharmony. You did in your speech. Um, I just want, this is a comment really rather than a question, but to say that uh, thank you for drawing our collective attention to the problems of disharmony. Um, we have had disharmony in European Jewish history, of course, for a long time. But what's happening now with the democratization, routinization, professionalization, etc., that you referred to, that cacophony will come more and more to the surface. Okay, it seems that we... Sure, sure you can. So I actually do have a question. Um, do you think, actually, um, you referred to the problem of museum specialists who all know about um, the ethnography of Passover Seder and so on, um, but never went to one. Um, do you think, seriously, that Jewish cultural heritage could form the basis of what a sociologist might call a new religion, for a new religion oh. for people who do not identify in Europe with Israeli politics, particularly, do not identify with Haredi orthodoxy, do not particularly want to become uh, active members of their local reform synagogue, but would like to take an educated interest in um, the Jewish past and called cultural heritage. Do you think, actually, that a grassroots interest in this field, which is unquestionably growing and unquestionably getting more and more visibility, do you think there's life in this concept really to invigorate uh, on the Jewish world? Do you mean this new kind of religion for those who are Jews, or is a bridge with non-Jews who also want to? Well, the kind of religion of humanity and its multiple traditions, why not? I mean, there might be people who are not feeling very Catholic these days, or... <laughs> 
Muslims who will one day want to break away and think of other things like heritage. But it would be a civic moment. It would be a Darkheimian moment. Uh, it will not prevent people from having religious identities and passions. It, is, uh, it would be a very rational, calm understanding of a common belonging. And we're not exactly in a rational, calm period. But I think it's worthwhile, and I think it will bri br build bridges, and it will be an important element. But then emotions will be carried out elsewhere for sure, even among the same people. They might do Jewish cultural or whatever heritage, and then on a given other day, uh, turn into emotional actors with a vision of transcendence. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much. Um, I was intrigued by your statement that, in a sense, the Jewish heritage and Jewish life are in an inverse relationship. The more life, the less heritage, or the less need for it. The more heritage, it seems, uh, maybe there's less life, uh, less Jewish life. And um, I don't know whether, uh, well, I think the situation with this museum in this moment, in this place, may be different from other parts of Europe. And I would be interested in your reflections on that. And simply to explain that, um, Rabbi Shudrick, our chief rabbi, says that the number of Jews in Poland is increasing, but the birth rate is not going up. And of course, what he means by that is that individuals who either didn't know or didn't care um, about their Jewish birth parents or grandparents, as, as the case may be, uh, somehow discover this information and many of them do something about it. And when asked why this information was withheld, very often the answer is fear and shame. And this museum can make a very powerful statement, uh, a kind of, if you will, answer or counter to this message of fear and shame, but also it can provide a resource that has been missing because of a broken chain of transmission. And so in that way, it is, um, it, you know, I think it has a very special role to play. But as to whether that's true in France, where the Jewish population today is larger than it was before the war, I understand, or in the UK, or in Germany, or Austria, or Italy, I, I would be interested in your reflections. Um. Yes, I agree with you fully, Barbara. I think this museum is a very special place given the long post-war period, the tragedy, and then the long post-war silence and then 1968 and so forth. So here it's not just a museum, it's a place in which a kind of new a Jewish identity can develop for those who did not even know they had Jewish ancestors or who didn't know what it meant to be a Jewish aunt. But I was reflecting on the fact that if you have a large, vibrant Jewish community, full of internal wars. I mean, I was just in Milan, and you must understand there's 7,000 Jews in Milan, all told 29,000 in Italy. 7,000 Jews in Milan, they have three Jewish schools that will not speak to each other. Now, here's a case of uh, a Jewish internal conflict, and how can 7,000 people support three entirely different Jewish schools? So this is the kind of element in which you have living Jews that are involved in their own... Uh, bickerings of Jewish life and linked to even orthodoxy in Israel or elsewhere. And the Jewish museum, by going into a Jewish museum, they are not going to feel more Jewish. They'll probably go in there and mumble about the fact that their Jewishness is not sufficiently represented. So the Jewish museum can, I think, perform such a function in places where, probably in Eastern Europe, where there just wasn't enough of a lived, open, visible, continuous Jewish identity through religion or community. That's all I wanted to say. It doesn't mean that there's a pecking order of importance, but Jewish heritage is all the more important with the fewer Jews. When you have masses of the Mez in France, there's civil war between them all the time, and consequently, there's Jewish life, and you won't be going to the museum to figure out who was right on this count or the other. And both are complementary and vital. Uh, I think Jewish museums in Western Europe are mainly more for the non-Jews. And um, Jewish museums, I think, in Central and Eastern Europe after 89 had to do, you know, fulfill both, both types of potential spectator, I mean, public, what do you call them, visitors. 
So uh, it's not a division of labor, but it is indeed, I mean, you know, you sort of, sort of you, do, do Israelis have to go to Jewish museums? Probably not. I mean, they would go to the Diaspora Museum to figure out how horrible life was wherever it was before their ancestors made Aliyah and the national formal Zionist understanding of Israel. Uh, Americans will go for roots, but they're probably the closest American Jews to the ethnic museums. Although, and I mention this again, uh, being Jewish is a very complex issue of constant pull and tensions, like an ellipse between particularism and universalism. There is no similar tension in any other so-called ethnic group. Even the notion of an ethnic group is something that, of course, lies at the heart of the Jewish-Polish story. It makes no sense whatsoever in my own Italian small Jewish community. Jews in Italy do not consider themselves an ethnic group. And Jews in Sweden have become an ethnic group because they got more state financing that way. Uh, and because many of them came from Eastern Europe, could understand the concept. So you have so many, you have a cacophony of Jewish identities in what is also a cacophony of all identities in a cacophony of democracies that are pulled in all directions. So this is a very complex period to negotiate. And I think that the Jewish, po the Poland Museum has nav navigated all of these things in a very brilliant manner. Yes, um, my name is Michael Mail. Uh, given the, the huge range of issues that you raised, I just wonder whether you're putting too much on cultural heritage and museums to address and solve all these issues. You know, there are obviously a plethora of organizations within the community and outside the community that address a whole range of issues. And I'm just wondering whether you're, you're expecting too much from this specific, shall we say, cultural heritage sector. I, I agree with you. I tried to pack in as much as I could in the minutes I had because they were all problems. None of them were solutions. But Jewish museums across Europe are the interface I wouldn't say the interfaith, because, but the interface with the non-Jewish wider world, it's not the synagogue that's going to create that kind of context, nor a Jewish community. This element of the Jewish museum is something that plays a civic role and a visible role that should and does most often go beyond an internal Jewish story. And I think what we're discussing is precisely the place of the Jew of Jews inside the wider national or European contexts. And I don't think, I can't think of any other institution except some schools of higher learning, of Jewish higher learning, that can fulfill that role. But these higher schools of Jewish learning that are open to non-Jews, um, that's a very small, minute group of people, whereas Jewish museums are bringing in kids from schools. And, you know, the, uh, the educational part of the Jewish museums of Europe is perhaps the most important once you you know, if you look at it in the long term. And um, I don't know. I mean, it would be terrible to, f I mean, I, I dread to do such a study because it would be horrendous, would be to see how many schools from the French banlieues went to the Jewish Museum of Paris and what happened to those students as they participated in, you know, in a growing type of anti-Semitism. I don't know. I almost would rather not know. But it is a burning question out there in the Western parts of this continent. So yes, I'm putting too much stuff on the plate, but that this is the plate in which Jews and non-Jews come face to face with a, a, a narrative, the Jewish Museum. Hello. It's been my experience that uh, those of my generation and younger generations are increasingly less uh, religiously inclined than those of older generations. And so I'm wondering how that plays into uh, representing and preserving uh, an identity, that being Jewish or, or Christian or Muslim, uh, that at its core rests on a religious ideology. There's an element, and it's played down beautifully here in the, the Poland Museum, but it's also played in other museums, and it perhaps should be played more, is the contribution. Let's, let's take the Jewish case, because this is what the conference is about. The Jewish humanistic universal perspective, I've always asked myself why it isn't that Europe's many, many hospitals, 
across the countries involved don't have a little plaque that says that most of them were actually, if they were not run by a religious Catholic order, many of them were really the product of Jewish philanthropists. And they were originally made because Jews couldn't enter the other hospitals, but then they became the avant-garde of scientific research, and then they were incorporated into national health systems. And it's these small notions of an identity, what does it mean? Then you can say, well, what does Jewish mean if you're not religious? Then there's a whole series of ways of living life charity, philanthropy, uh, the most advanced progressive notions, these elements can also be played up, not to say Jews are fantastic, but just what was the role of the Jews and how has this role been forgotten as countries moved on? This is one example. Other examples are, you know, the whole notion of Jewish literacy. Why was it that, you know, or even do something like explain why studying the Talmud then created once the, the Jewish you know, emancipation came on. How is it that all of these boys that went to the haders and then the yeshivot, which are beautifully presented here or downstairs in the Polin exhibition, what happened to them once they entered the wider society? How were they able to become, you know, almost overnight linguists, literary critics, psychoanalysts, mathematicians? I mean, all of a sudden, yes, you can say that the Gaon of Vilna said we should know more about the modern sciences, but what kind of a accumulated a millennial ability to learn because learning and reading was crucial to being Jewish, what was the impact into the wider world? These are questions that I think would be very interesting to be addressed in museums to understand what it is about breaking like a nuclear fusion, an explosion of a, of a Jewish nucleus uh, into the wider world. And I would do something on that, specifically because it's kind of a miracle. I mean, I'm not sure if you come out of a madrasa in Pakistan, you can then turn yourself into a man, you know, spectacular uh, literary theorist, maybe. But the point is that the Talmudic page has five or six interpretations. It's the closest thing to any, an ancient website. I would play with that if I were, you know, to do anything like an exhibition. And this is not being religious about having to understand what the Jewish God wants or does not want of his Jewish people. Or I would simply say that the strength of the, the, the Jewish tradition would be that of dialoguing. Here is a deity that has at least four or five names that you, you enter into dialogue with. It's neither a very Christian nor a very Muslim position. Again, one can do that. But I still remember what Silly Kugelman told me at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, that no one knows anything about their respective religious traditions. So how do you make such a statement without without giving the impression that the Jews feel that, you know, their God is superior or more modern or more web compatible or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You see, from that point of view. So it should be a place of pick and choose. It should also be a place of uh, spectacular truths. And I find this museum, it's not because I'm here with Barbara in front of me or Darius Stola on the right that I'm trying to give all these compliments. I think it is an amazing achievement what has been done here, given the fraught history. You have it all, it's there. Click on the button, no more if you want. It's not the case, you've learned, I think Poland has learned from the mistakes of other museums. And it's not, you know, this is a virtual museum in the sense that so little is left. But you know, what do you do when you when you have a, a French community that is, you know, you know, very fractious and living, and for whom the Jewish Museum is only for the intellectuals amongst it, because for the others, it's they don't care. They've got the community center, the synagogue, their kosher kitchens, and so forth. So it's a very different mixture, and I would love to see more done along the lines of this, you know, brutal truth put forward calmly for those who wish to know. For those who wish to know, that is the whole problem. How many wish to know? And I don't know, there's no answer for that. Uh, it's five past two already, and we will have some time to digest half of the questions you have unloaded on us. Uh, we are going to have the lunch break now. Please join me in thanking the keynote speaker, Diane Pinker. <laughs>